Good morning, everybody. Uh, great pleasure to be here. This session is called Meet the Trailblazers. Um, what's the point of meeting trailblazers? Uh, it's highly unlikely you're going to become one by um, sitting in the same room as one and listening to their story any more than you'll become a great sportsman uh, by talking to a long jumper or become a great violinist by talking to a, a violinist. However, on the other hand, it does seem uh, ridiculous to have sort of abstract discussions about innovation and pioneering uh, without actually talking to people who've done it. So um, we will be meeting some in this session. Now, um, I'm struck, as I have spoken to them today, by the precariousness of the trailblazers' existence. The uh, thin line between discovery and futility, uh, between good luck and bad luck, between genius and insanity. Um, and the history of, in fact, of Nobel Prizes reveals all. Uh, in 1927, the Nobel Prize went to the man, the Nobel Prize for medicine went to the man who came up with the idea of giving malaria to people who were suffering dementia. Uh, not a good idea. Not one of the best remembered Nobel Prizes. And then on the other hand, you may remember Mr. Chandra Sekhar, the uh, man who postulated the existence of black holes in the 1930s, who was laughed at and finally got a Nobel Prize for that in 1983. Uh, poor chap. So precarious existence. The difference between uh, being laughed at and being successful is a very, very fine one. We're going to meet three trailblazers. We're going to meet uh, Kerry Moulis, the chemistry Nobel Prize winner, uh, whose uh, innovations in polymerase chain reactions, uh, insights he had in his car one evening, got him a Nobel Prize. Uh, we're going to meet um, Lalit Modi, the commissioner of the Indian Premier League, the, one of the biggest sporting tournaments now in the world, from nothing to billions of eyeballs and billions of dollars of revenue over the course only of two years. And before we meet both of those, and I'll chat to each of them individually, their stories are both very, very interesting. Um, we'll have a little chance for questions at the end of our 45 minutes. But before we listen uh, and chat to those two, we're going to have a presentation from another trailblazer, from Bjark Ingels, who's one of the most innovative architects uh, in the Western world now, the founder of uh, BIG, Bark Ingalls, Bark Ingalls Group, which he set up in 2005. He's been working and running his own office for the large, last decade or so. Uh, has, has academic connections at Columbia and Harvard, and has also written his own, if you like, manifesto, Yes is More. It's in um, comic book style, so it's an easy read. And we have a number of copies which in the course of this session, we have to work out how to give away to good folks here. We have about five copies to give away. We'll find a way of uh, distributing those through our session. But before we, before we start in the conversation, we're going to listen to Biark, who's going to talk us through a presentation on his work. Thank you, Biark. Thank you very much indeed. Well, um, es essentially, um, architecture is the sort of uh, collective effort of continuously uh, refurbishing the surface of our planet so that the, our cities and our buildings fit better with the, with the way we want to live. Um, and that's why we sort of uh, would like to depart from this sort of traditional image of the radical architect as this sort of radical young man rebe rebelling against the establishment, that somehow radicality is almost always negatively defined by sort of who or what you are against. So rather than revolution, we're in interested in the idea of evolution uh, essentially like how sort of our cities and buildings evolve by sort of constantly incorporating input from the surrounding world. So in a way, sort of rather than the sort of um, exclusive attitude of, uh, of modernism with, you know, less is more, uh, we believe that yes is more, that essentially by saying yes to all the sort of conflicting and contradicting demands and concerns and even compromises of society, we can actually create sort of more interesting and diverse cities to live in. Um, so what I'd like to do now, sort of to focus the scope, is to uh, look at three takes on what role sort of architects or architecture can play in the sort of growing concern for sustainability. And, uh, and you can say sort of sustainability is quite often understood as this sort of neo-Protestant idea that it has to hurt in order to do good. 
uh, the sort of notion that you're, you're not supposed to take long, warm showers because it's bad for the environment. Um, sort of, so gradually, we all get this sort of idea that sustainable life is less fun than normal life. Um, so um, when we were sort of recently asked to sort of uh, do the Danish pavilion for the Shanghai World Expo that focuses on sustainability, we thought it could be interesting to focus on examples where a sustainable city actually increases the quality of life, the sort of uh, notion of hedonistic sustainability. So we asked ourselves, what could sort of Denmark possibly show China that would be relevant to the Chinese? You know, one of the biggest countries in the world, one of the smallest, uh, sort of China symbolized by the great dragon. Uh, in Denmark, we have a national bird, the swan. Um, China has many great poets, but we discovered that in the Chinese public school curriculum, they have three fairy tales by Antushun, or Hans Christian Andersen, as we call him. And that basically means that all 1.3 billion Chinese grew up with the, the Little Mermaid. Um, the biggest tourist attraction in, uh, in China is uh, the Great Wall that is reportedly visible from outer space, or at least sort of Google Earth. Um, the biggest tourist attraction in Denmark is, uh, is the Little Mermaid that is that is like hardly even visible from the canal to us. <laughs> so there's like these sort of obvious differences between you know, Shanghai and Copenhagen. They're both port cities, but of completely different scales and qualities. Um, so then we started looking at recent urban developments. Like this is Shanghai 30 years ago, bicycles everywhere. Now you have traffic jams everywhere. The bicycle has even been forbidden in several places. Meanwhile, in Copenhagen, we're expanding our bicycle lanes. A third of all Danes commute by bike. Uh, and we have a system of free bicycles called the city bike. So we asked ourselves, why don't we actually relaunch the bicycle as something cool in China? We create the Danish pavilion as a, like a loop of a, almost like a, a Danish street where the Chinese can bike around on the Danish city bikes, sort of experience how fun it is to ride a bike rather than sort of sitting in a traffic jam or looking for a parking spot. Um, as I mentioned, both Copenhagen and Shanghai are port cities. Uh, but in Copenhagen, our water has become so clean that you can swim in it. Uh, one of the first uh, projects we did was actually the harbor bath in Copenhagen uh, that sort of extends public life into the water. And we thought in the same way, like, why don't we let the Chinese experience this? Like, uh, at the heart of the pavilion, there's this harbor bath where the Chinese can actually experience how clean, if not how cold, the Danish water is. Sort of um, basically in the middle of the city, if, if your rivers and, and, uh, and, and harbors are clean, you can actually swim. Um, and in the middle of this harbor bath, for six months, we proposed to actually place the, the Little Mermaid, uh, not a copy, but the actual mermaid. Uh, she's now gone to, uh, to China for, for six months. Um, so essentially, like the, the 1.3 billion Chinese that grew up with the mermaid can now sort of experience her in real life. Finally, sort of to make sure that the, the pavilion doesn't only sort of contain sort of sustainable experiences, uh, that it also operates sustainably, we decided to eliminate all air conditioning so the spiral form of, uh, of the building actually allows the, the thermal rise of, of hot air to sort of uh, create a natural breeze. Uh, it is then sort of ejected through sort of a, a perforated facade that also allows Chinese people to photograph the mermaid. Um, so basically, these are some, uh, some images of the final result that just opened the 1st of May. But, but recently, like this is uh, one of the first visuals we did of the, of the Danish pavilion. And if you know, sort of notice the red frame, uh, and this is an image of Tony, Tony Stark's Mad Science Expo in the new Iron Man movie. Uh, and if you sort of compare the two red frames, uh, basically this is uh, Hollywood and this is Shanghai. So I think just to conclude, when, uh, when Hollywood starts ripping off eco-architecture to portray sci-fi, it could be a sign that sort of a sustainable architecture has become more fun than the, the normal architecture. Um, the, the next idea that I'd like to introduce is the notion of, of architectural alchemy. The idea that by sort of mixing traditional ingredients, you can actually create gold or at least added value. Um, we were recently asked to do a, a, an apartment building and a parking house. And we thought that rather than having like a, a stack of apartments looking at a block of parking, we would sort of turn all the apartments into penthouses, place them on a podium of cars. And essentially all the, the cars, they occupy the deep space uh, on the ground. And all the apartments, they sort of occupy the, the roofscape where they have sort of a, a nice sort of south-facing slope with a view and where each apartment actually gets a, a house with a, with a garden. So um, this is what the, the building looks like. Um, the parking also becomes this sort of almost like a diagonal public space underneath the, the apartments. Uh, its facade, again, we wanted to make it naturally ventilated. And in this case, we discovered that by sort of 
uh, increasing and decreasing the, the perforations, we could create a rasterized image. Um, since we always refer to the project as the mountain, we ended up commissioning a Japanese Himalaya photographer that gave us this sort of beautiful photo of Mount Everest, sort of transforming the entire facade into a, an urban artwork. Inside the apartments, it's almost like this sort of south-facing urban oasis. The wood of the apartment sort of continues outside. You have these gardens, uh, and all the rainwater that drops on the mountain is accumulated in a big water tank, and in dry periods, there's an irrigation system, which means that sort of in one or two years, the, the mountain in Copenhagen is going to transform into this sort of Cambodian temple ruin completely covered in, uh, in green. Um, the same idea of like how sort of different programs gravitate towards their ideal position in, a, in an urban block. Uh, we sort of took to a new level with this project in, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, a really big block. And we asked ourselves, how can you actually make such a big block sort of diverse and interesting? Um, what you normally do in Copenhagen is that you do a lot of identical apartments, and then you put on different facades as this sort of form of cosmetic diversity. But if you thought like sort of different programs actually have different needs, like offices and shops, they like to be close to the, to the customers on the ground. Apartments uh, want to be higher, uh, but since housing is less deep than offices, we get extra space for like little gardens and maybe even a small path so the kids can run down and play with their neighbors almost like a neighborhood of townhouses, then more sort of classic apartments, and then finally sort of penthouse row houses with front lawns and, and roof gardens. Uh, the sort of the master plan dictated a pedestrian passage through the block, so we turn it into a figure eight. And then finally sort of offices, they like daylight, but they hate glare, and they spend energy on cooling. So to the south, we sort of reduce them to, uh, to zero and lift them up in the north to allow sort of a... Um, a four-story office building and sort of elevate the, the apartments into the sun. And in, re in reverse to the southwest, we sort of push the corner down, opening up the entire courtyard for daylights and views. And this sort of distortion of the block sort of short circuits uh, the path, creating like a public path sort of entering the entire building. Um, we started uh, building the, the project uh, right before the, the sort of onslaught of the global financial crisis. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the other developers uh, didn't get started, so uh, <laughs> people moving in are going to have like a spectacular view for the next five to ten years. Um, but uh, in, in January, we sort of completed the loop, and we could make this sort of virgin journey uh, that sort of essentially not only does this sort of uh, idea of architectural alchemy allow each program to occupy its favorite position in the three-dimensional block, but it also expands public life and the possibility of social encounters beyond the street all the way to the, to the roof of the building uh, and back down again. So as you can see, it's, it's almost like a hybrid between a sort of uh, a Mediterranean mountain village and a sort of a, a Copenhagen perimeter block. So basically, the, um, sort of as, a, as a sort of a conclusion of this, the last sort of idea that the, I'd like to present uh, became possible uh, a year and a half ago when a minister from Azerbaijan came to Copenhagen um, and uh, he fell in love with like, uh, some of our work, especially the, the mountain or the idea that you can make sort of mountains out of architecture. Um, he told us uh, that the capital of Azerbaijan, Baku, is facing this desert island that has been closed down for development because they're afraid that like, a, a wall of mediocre high-rises would sort of ruin the view of the capital to the Caspian Sea. So he suggested, what if we could make an urban development that would recreate the silhouettes of the seven most significant mountains of, uh, of Azerbaijan? So um, we, th we thought it sounded like a sort of megalomaniac idea, but uh, so we loved it. And essentially, um, Baku is this sort of crescent bay overlooking the desert island of Zira, almost like the, the diagram of the Azeri flag. And, uh, and our commission was to sort of sample the topo topographies of the seven most significant mountains of Azerbaijan and sort of translate them into sort of rational and, and functional structures for human life. Um, and because the island is a desert island, it has no infrastructure, it has no energy, it has no water, uh, it has no sewers, uh, we decided to sort of conceive as the entire island of a, as a single ecosystem. So uh, we use sort of um, windmills to, uh, to drive desalination plants, increasing the amount of fresh, uh, fresh water. We use the, uh, the heat of the sun to sort of heat the water. We use the thermal properties of water to heat and cool the buildings. And finally, sort of all the excess water from, uh, from the, sort of the human life 
instead of like dumping it in a sewer, we created like this system of uh, organic root zone gardens that organically clean the water and actually gradually increase the amount of, uh, of water that comes to this dry island. And sort of uh, in time, the entire sort of desert island is going to turn into this sort of lush green landscape. You can say where um, sustainable, uh, or you can say where sort of urban development normally heavily, uh, happens at the expense of nature. Uh, in this case, it almost creates the nature. Um, and the different mountains, rather than merely looking like mountains, they also perform like ecosystems that they sort of uh, create shelter from the wind. They accumulate the, the heat of the sun and, uh, and they sort of gather all the rainwater in, in creeks and, uh, and lakes. So um, after working on it for six months, uh, it, uh, it got approved by the, by the president and uh, in, uh, with a little luck and, uh, and some absence of financial crisis. Uh, in, in 10 years, uh, what started as essentially like the, the mountain in Copenhagen could become uh, uh, the seven peaks of, uh, of Azerbaijan. So essentially, you, know, you can say like, as our presence as humans on the surface of the, of the planet sort of increases in extent and numbers, our sort of, um, let's say, capacity, but also obligation to take responsibility of actually creating ecosystems for both human life, but also all, all other all forms of life on the on the planet. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Bjork. Let me ask our, our other two trailblazers to come up and, uh, and take their seats as well. But while, while they come up, Bjork, I looked at your website, and you've got little icons for all the projects that your company has been engaged in. And you, you categorize them that are kind of ideas, which is a huge pile. And then in progress, which is a kind of medium-sized pile, and then the completed ones are a much smaller pile. So, do you, what's the sort of ratio of kind of brilliant wheezes like this Seven Peaks of Azerbaijan to actual completions? Do you do you accept that you're going to lose 60 or 80 percent of all your brilliant ideas? Well, I, th I think using the term ideas is sort of an optimistic uh, way of coining failure, because um, I said failure, uh, but it's essentially. Um, I think like roughly like 5%. It's a, it's a bit like in, in Darwin, uh, the Darwin uh, idea of evolution that only like a very few species actually survive and only they pass their attributes on to the next generation. So I think out of, uh, I think we actually committed like 200 projects and, uh, and f until now only eight have been built. <laughs> but, uh, so it's a kind of frustrating uh, ratio, but you know, life is, uh, life is tough. And the, <laughs> and the National Bank of Iceland, which was one of your commissions. Yeah, we were so lucky to win this uh, like glorious international competition uh, two, two months before the total uh, crackdown. Essentially, yeah. like, I, I was like, we were sort of celebrating that you know, finally we were working directly for the people that actually print the money. So uh, like, <laughs> only, two, only two things could go wrong. Either sort of, uh, like all of Iceland would disappear in a volcanic cloud. That, that basically happened now. <laughs> or, or, the, or the entire country could go bankrupt. That, uh, that happened then. That happened then, yeah. So, um, <laughs> Kerry, Kerry Mullis, you won your um, Nobel Prize for, why don't you tell us what you won it for? Well, just give us the sort of the, 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 the 30 second summary. Uh, 30 seconds, DNA is uh, something that we all have. In fact, I've, I've, at this conference, DNA starts to being a generic term for all kinds of the soul of a company, whatever. But what it, what it used to be, and it still is, is this long, it's completely, it's absolutely ridiculously long molecule that is actually 24 from inside of your cells. And they have about 7 billion, if you, if you take the little strands apart, it's about 7 billion bases in there. Billion, which it took a while for me to capture. That's a lot of them. <laughs> but the and and most of the time, when this was starting in about 1983, somewhere around there, you were only interested. We were only interested in, say, four or five of those, like in the case of, of looking at a, a a kid that might be born with sickle cell anemia. There's only one, base that either it was going to be an A or it was going to be a T. And if it was going to be an A, it was going to be okay. It was going to be a T. If it was a T, sickle cell anemia. And we had to figure out how do you, how do you do that? How do you, how, do you, how do you measure that kind of thing? And how do you do it? What I was thinking of is how do you do that quick? Because the way that there was very thin of doing it had to do with cloning. And it, had, it took like about you know, three or four months with many people working on it. While the mother 
It's freaking, yeah, right? Yeah. And so I said, why can't we do that in about one shift at a hospital? That would be better. And people knew, though, that this insight was, this technique was waiting to happen. I mean, and it was you who just had a eureka moment in a car driving your girlfriend. I think most people didn't really think that it was going to happen. In fact, most people, after I thought about it and said, it does work, I've got it working in my laboratory, most people still didn't believe it. So that, that's, a, right. that's a problem with innovation, is it generally is kind of not acceptable. So that's PCR, polymer, mm -hmm. polymerase chain, chain reaction. reaction. Right. Just update us, what are you doing now? It's I'm trying to stuff. cure a whole bunch of diseases. We have uh, got ourselves in a situation where we have used antibiotics thoroughly for, but since the 40s, and they have protected us from all kinds of things that used to kill us, and now those things uh, are getting used to the antibiotics, they're getting resistant to them. Things like Staphylococcus aureus uh, is one of the most famous ones, like MRSA, they call it. It'll kill you now if you get certain strains of it. And what we're trying to do, I've thought of a, a new way to like make something that actually looks like an antibiotic in the sense that you take it like a pill or something, or you even breathe it through your, through your lungs. And it, 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 it makes a specific contact between the pathogen, this is a chemical, between the pathogen and an immune response that you already have to something totally different. And it, may, it fools your immune system into thinking you're now immune to that thing. And it'll happen within 20 minutes, kind of. And, uh, and your immune system will attack it. So it's a, it's a, it's a big deal. It's going to it work. work. If it, it's it, going to work, or? It's, it's worked on anthrax, which was a tough one. I mean, we, had, we went from 40, <laughs> 40 with, well, you, with this is with rats. With the rats. It, with, yeah. with the best technology we had before, 40% of them could be saved from this pulmonary answer. We had 100% survival, and we did it many times, so it works fine on that. It worked on another disease, and now we're working on some th things that, are, that have more economic right. and more value because there's a lot of people dying. Now, if we want to understand trailblazers and we want to follow your story, we have to say you're a maverick, right? I mean, you, you're willing to take on some journalist wrote community. that about 10 years ago, so I've been a maverick ever since. Yeah. And I, it, but it's true, but though, I'm right? sort of a maverick in the sense that, um, well, I, I don't uh, follow the sort of general course of things. And sort of a, I, I do a lot of reading. I mean, that's what I do most of the time. And I, I sort of follow my nose to wherever things are, and I don't think about what, what is it that other people are doing right now that I could do just a little bit better. I'm normally just following my own ideas. So we have the word alchemy in Bjark's presentation, but there's a sort of alchemy, isn't there? Because you, well, I'm a so you're quite widely read. You, yeah, yeah, you, 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 you studied biochemistry, but you wrote about astrophysics as a, as a grad student, right? And well, you know, that was kind of weird, but you know, I was a second year graduate student at Berkeley, key, right? and I had a great idea, and I said, Nature would be interested in this. And that was my favorite magazine. They had no intent, I mean, they, really, they didn't really have a good interest. They didn't understand why they didn't, but they, they, they accepted it. And so I, I started, I said, wow, I could be an astrophysicist if I wanted to. Do people, but I decided I didn't want to be. The people, do, do, is it the, the fate of a trailblazer to be ridiculed and laughed at sometimes? I mean, you, uh, yeah. you've defended astrology. I haven't defended it. I have just shown definitive <laughs> proof to myself and to anybody that's willing to look at the data that if you take simple kinds of things like lists of the, the, the say, the, the guys that have been directing the Vienna Symphony, like Symphonic Orchestra for the last 100 years or 150 years, and you say, when were those guys born? They should have been born scattered all over the different months, and they aren't. There's, there's about 22% of them, 23% of them that are born in Aries, which, you know, they point sticks and they say, do this, do that. Do this. That's kind of an Aries trait. <laughs> and, you know, the, if you and look at, if you look at the guys that are We can go to Wikipedia. We can look up. Yeah, this is all on Wikipedia. I just go, I use it Wikipedia because it's trustworthy for that kind of thing. You know, you're there on a fake birthday. And if you look at the Apollo astronauts, what are they? They're Pisces. Pisces don't care whether they're upside down or not. You, know? <laughs> you would never, a Capricorn like myself would not want to be upside right. down. And, you know? now, I just want to get one last question. You, your roots, your childhood. The key thing about your childhood was you were allowed to go out and get My, your, eat the soil and <sighs> play with the worms. My mother was brought up on a farm. She was not terrified. She knew what to do with a snake. You cut his head off with a shovel. You, know? <laughs> you, you don't freak out. 
And she's always say, we kid, kids can't go out in the woods by themselves. And my brother and I and my cousins, we, just, we spent most of our time out in the woods. And, and you, were, you were making rockets age 13. Oh, that was, yeah, it was a little later. I was, I was 13, and I, I, I realized, I mean, that was the, the space age was starting. And I was sending them things. And I realized frogs probably have aspirations for space, too. You know? <laughs> and and we, had, we had lots of little ones in our yard that would fit into the, those little aluminum cans that you bought 35 millimeter film in. So I designed a rocket that was about four feet tall by the time I got through with it that would put one up two miles and get him two back alive. Miles. Two, damn two miles. Two miles up. Yeah, and probably pressed him pretty hard down there into the little <laughs> thing for a while. But they came back alive. And, um, and um, yeah. And it was, I mean, somebody, I thought they were going about two miles because I was sighting along this thing. I was watching for this little red parachute because the rocket would disappear. But when I saw the red parachute, you know, points this thing at it, and I had a little protractor and on there, and I said, how far am I from this? Yeah. And uh, somebody's father, who was a, had a pilot, I mean, he had a little airplane, he didn't believe it. And so he flew over our site one day, and he was at about a mile and a half, and I think he streaking past his airplane, and he said, Jesus Christ. You know? it was, it was, that was back at a time when a kid could walk into a hardware store and buy 100 feet of dynamite fuse, you know? <laughs> And there was no questions asked. I could go up to the druggist Damn and say, I need, I need potassium nitrate by the pound, not by these little Damn bottles. Damn it now, either. these health and safety bureaucrats <laughs> are just getting in the way of all fun, aren't they? So if you thought you might be a trailblazer, it's too late if you haven't, uh, if you haven't at least anymore, made a quest yeah. for space by age 13. Uh, Lalit Modi, you didn't have any rocket experiences as a... Uh, I wish I did. No. But you had a meteoric experience with the, um, the IPL. So you, the story is, for those who have not followed world cricket, and there are a lot of people who don't, but there are a lot of people who do. Uh, you're on the BCCI, the Board of Control of Cricket in India. Correct. It's a big sport in India. And then you have an idea about when. But when did you first think, let's do it a different way with this thing, the Indian Premier League? The Indian Premier League in June of 2007 is when I decided that India was ready to launch a cricket league. And we needed a league which is similar to the NFL, NBA, and the English Premier League. So why not try and create a league where people actually own teams? And, but to get the people interested, there were two things in, in the world. In India, actually, what people watch, one was cricket, and second was Bollywood. Um, how do you combine the two together uh, is the key. So you get the it's top the alchemy. It's the alchemy, it's the alchemy again. again. Of it's course. The alchemy. So you've got to key. get the Bollywood masala add it to the cricket, and you've got something <laughs> called cricketainment. And you add a little bit of the cheerleaders and music and, and live performances. And we thought that we had the right formula, because cricket primarily was watched 98% by male. And the issue was, how do you get the female and the children to start watching it? And the only way you could get the remote control in the hand of, of the housewife was actually to make sure there was some Bollywood masala in there and there's some music in there. So keeping those two things as something that we definitely needed to have is, is we couldn't get the, the Bollywood people to come and play the cricket, of course. So the only way to do it is get them on a team. Because we are, we are starstruck in our country. And you know, whenever a Bollywood top actor goes out or she goes out, and the whole country wants to be there and mingle with them. And then the other thing was that everybody watched sports in the daytime in India. Is how do we make sure, and so we didn't want to cut into the revenues we were already making uh, in the daytime with our own cricket, so we said, why don't we go after the soap operas and the movie business, which is in the night? So why not schedule all these matches at night, 8 o'clock, unheard of. Everybody's prime time. Prime time. Prime time TV is key, because that's where the dollars go up per 10 seconds for the slot time. So, so the idea was package it together and put all of this get the top cricketers to come and play, and go out and auction the teams, and find the best players to play for you. The issue became, how do you make sure that all teams are equal? Because you have a Manu, Manu is always a Manu, you know, so they're always gonna, you know, Manu or Chelsea, oh, yeah. or, or Liverpool's gonna be, or Arsenal's gonna be up there, not to offend anybody. But the objective of all, one of the objectives I had was, because I had been in the television business, is that whenever you have teams that consistently perform, they consistently have a higher fan base and have higher viewership and ultimately end up making higher money at the end of the day. 
The issue is how do you make the games totally unpredictable? Right. And how do you ensure that all teams are equal? So some people have more money in their pocket. Some people have less money in their pocket in terms of a team owner. So one can go and buy more players and <coughs> buy lesser players or a higher price or lower price. So the idea here was why don't we try and come up with a new system and we examine all the different leagues around the world. And we found the good qualities in each one of them. But we still couldn't get over the issue of how do you ensure that all teams are equal. And the idea just was just born one day. We're sitting at an auction in England, at a Christie's auction, actually, it was. And so why don't we look at actually auctioning the players? Put all the players in a pot and give everybody the equal amount of money. Oh, I see. So you get, OK, so it's really socialist in principle, basically. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in principle. But you give all the teams the equal amount of money. Everybody has to buy every player through an auction process. And you only buy the asset for three years. Oh God, it's horrible for the players who are left at the end, isn't it? It is, of price. course. And that's true. It's but like on it the other hand, school when I was when they used to pick the teams. Yeah, but what yeah. it did is, what it did is, you, there was, you know, you have many, many good players in many disciplines. And what it did is that, if one team bought the best batsman, somebody else bought the best bowler, somebody yeah. best all rounder, and the best wicketkeeper. So you know, you, you just spread it around. And you televised the auction. We televised so the auction. So you've got yes. the. It's Everything is televised. It's, it's a, a double head, yes. Right. That, that actually changed the whole thing and made everybody equal, and the teams became equal. So we've got a sequence of decisions, of clever innovations, really, that did change the, the name of the And it is, we should just say, mega successful. From nothing to, what, about $4 billion of revenues last year. and uh, Not revenue. I mean, the valuation of, of right. the brand itself has gone to about four, over $4 billion, right. yes. Right. But the key is not the money. The key is the viewership and the fans that we built. You know, we did in the finals this year 140, 49 million viewers. And so, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's one of the highest watched sporting events yeah. in the world. You know, we, so that, that's what we hard out American football. Yeah, and, you, you know, know, the cricket's coming. Okay, now, um, <laughs> you're a trailblazer. I asked uh, Kerry whether trailblazers, it's their, they, they, their fate to be laughed at. You have been in a lot of trouble lately. All the time. From, from I the mean, very, we should very say you, that you've received notice of suspension of your position on the BCCI. You're, you're suspended as commissioner of the IPL. Allegations of, well, I mean, it would be it would be easier to list the things you had that haven't been alleged. I couldn't agree more. You, yes, uh, in the last couple of weeks, did you do it? No. <laughs> so why why do you think so many charges? I know you can't talk too much about all of this. Obviously, this is all under investigation. Why do you think you've become the focus of so many charges? I guess because we got you know, 149 million viewers, and everybody wants to know how we got there and how we did do it so fast. The key was, again, um, we grew up too fast. We, we outblew every number on the table. We outblew every, um, you know, every number. Uh, Everything that everybody said, everybody said it can be done, and we said we could do it. And we always surpassed every plan that we put on the table. And I guess it pissed so off a lot of people. So there are people who are jealous. I mean, there are people off a lot who of people. Yes. they want a piece, or they've been left out in some way, so they want to pull it down. Just, yes, without doubt. Yeah, but it would, be, it would be amazing, wouldn't it, to create something as big as the IPL in a country as bureaucratic as India without, at some stage, corners having to be cut and, you know, I think bribes that, having to be paid. I mean, any number of things. It, it just seems like it. You know, we live in a very complex society at the end of the day. And to get something like the IPL up and running um, from scratch, where the entire system is against you across the world, is a, it's a difficult task, without, without doubt. And then last year, as you know, we had to move to South Africa. Um, when the tournament was scheduled to be in 21 days, and to move 18,000 people yeah. across continents and get it up and running, and still um, meeting and exceeding all expectations in, for sponsors, yeah. team owners, fans alike, was a big task. Well, I was, going to, I was going to talk about that, but I mean, this whole issue, though, it's very difficult to make omelets, isn't it, without breaking eggs? And I just, yes. you must have just broken a lot of eggs. In I your guess you broke a lot of eggs, yes. You've got to keep breaking eggs. You've got to keep, keep pushing the envelope. You've got to innovate. You've got to, you do, you've got to do a paradigm shift. If you're not, you're not going to make it. And yeah. that was the key. I mean, you had to keep pushing the envelope all the time. You've got to surpass what everybody else has done. You've got to think out of the box. 
And that move to South Africa, I mean, that was extraordinary. You think of how much time we spend preparing for things like the World Cup, soccer, we, how much time we're spending preparing for the Olympics. You go 21 days, suddenly there's a security question mark over the IPL. Yes. Uh, let's move it to South, South Africa. Africa. Or England. You know, yeah, well, you had, a, you had another contest between England and South Africa, which yes. uh, we, we, we were all bitterly gutted not to have got it. What was the weather? Yeah, that was no, nothing no, else. It I mean, love doesn't your rain that much here. It really doesn't rain that much here. God's <laughs> sake. It rains more in Rome, I heard this morning. Yes. <laughs> um, but, but you moved it. So, so, I mean, that, that's extraordinary that you could have logistically picked up a tournament and in three weeks, dumped I think it in another country. I, don't, I just don't know how you could have, how you did that. I mean, the secret actually is that if we, had, we were going to hold the tournament in eight cities in India, if we had shortened the number of cities, everybody said, why don't you do it in three or four cities in South Africa, we would have never been able to do it. What we did is actually take the eight cities, replicate those eight cities in, in South Africa. We said, we will do it in eight cities in okay. South Africa. So your template so we worked. Your, so your, we just superimposed the entire plan, pushed it into another country, moved 18,000 people across in 24 hours, and you know, we got the plan up and running. And a great rehearsal for them for the, the World, Cup. World Cup. I mean, I think the government, the government I, I don't think I, the government really did go out of the way, and we had no security problems. I mean, there was fears that there would be security issues, issues in South Africa, but I must say we, they went out of the way, and we had a very, very successful tournament. Excellent. Right, we'll take, we'll take some questions to any or all of our uh, trailblazers if you want to um, queue up at the mics. But what I want to ask each of you is, who do you admire? Who are the trailblazers who, who kind of you admire? Um, the arc, who's, who, who, who are you a fan of? Um, I mean, I've been in love with basically every single architect uh, since the last like 150 years. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, th I think right right now, like uh, I know, I'm, I must say, like, really, like uh, reading uh, reading the origin of species and the whole sort of a, a Darwin account of how all of the the forms of uh, of the biosphere were designed, and I, I love the fact that the people that actually criticize Darwin, they talk about divine design, uh, almost like when you talk about architects, this idea of a, of a single creator that sort of. Quibbles some kind of sketch down and then passes it on to some yeah. executive morons that have to sort of execute it. Uh, that this sort of much more sort of material process of actually evolving ideas, uh, it's been sort of a, it's been really sort of a mind blowing inspiration for how architecture and design and ideas really evolve. Yeah. What about you, Kerry? Who are your well, heroes? You know, one of my one of my heroes, all of them are dead. Johann Kepler, I like him a lot. I, I like him because. He, he was he was sort of like, uh, he was controversial. He was saying some things that people didn't like and stuff, but he knew they were right. He was, uh, he was an interest, he had an interesting life, a hard time. Uh, I, I like Richard Feynman, but, but you're he, very just, Richard he's Feynman funny, you know. Actually, aren't you? You're, 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 I think I've been, uh, see, people, I, I, you know, stupidly, he, he, he I, li I moved down to San Diego before he died, and I could have just, driven over every, any day, and I didn't do it. But I knew all about him, and I had read all his books, and so I'm sure he would have talked to me. But um, I, one morning I heard him on the radio, he was dead, and I, said, I was really down, because I didn't go to see yeah, him. No, he's a, he was a very fine man, wasn't he? He, 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 he had a lot, of, yeah. a lot of fun with his life, yeah. and did a lot yeah. of, lot no, of interesting good. things. What about you, Lalit? Who are you? Three controversial, not controversial, I mean, people. No, be controversial. <laughs> Branson, Murdoch, because Murdoch changed the world of broadcasting, I would think. Murdoch went out of his way and pushed the envelope everywhere, Rupert. Branson created brands out of nothing. He went out there and used the Virgin brand well. And then finally, you know, Google, you know, you look, look at them. You're I mean, such I'm, a flatterer, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact, you know, that, that's why I must say that, you know, th what they have done is push the envelope also, and they've changed the way. And I'm telling you now, sitting here today, they will change the way we watch television, the way we watch product, because that's the pipeline. You famously had this YouTube deal, actually. That was another of the innovations in the IPL, was say, look, I'm going to give broadcasting rights, but there are also going to be these yeah, that other upset, rights. That upset a lot of people around the world, because we were the first sporting body in the world that said, forget the broadcaster. We're going to go out there, give our lives right, live rights to YouTube, run it free of cost across the world. And it's a paradigm shift. For us, it's all about building fan base. For me, it was all about building fan base, and anybody could watch the product live. What better way to go is than YouTube, because they have the pipe anywhere in the world. 
and that's what's going to change the world going forward. Have we got any questions at the mic? I mean, don't feel obliged to ask questions because I've got plenty. So, it, yeah, go ahead, sir. Question for you. How do you get into the conflict of getting the, the modern architecture in a city like London? Uh, recently, we had here in London this problem with Rogers and, and the barracks that they were trying to do something very modern. And the Prince of England went into, into the the conflict and said and write a, a letter to the Qatar authority, I think that they were the one promoting, and they stop it. How do you see it? Do you know about this case, Bjarne? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. That, the, that the, somehow the royalty intervened and, uh, and killed the Do you have problems with your royal family in uh, uh, No, uh, <laughs> like uh, we have very beautiful princesses in Denmark. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> No, like, uh, Maybe they can marry. We've got some very beautiful young princes who are... Uh, actually, uh, uh, um, I've, I've gotten a death threat uh, uh, from, a, from a politician, actually, who got, then got sued uh, and reported to the police. He says they've got it all the time. He said, you, you've got <laughs> exactly. solidarity no, but for an architect, it's pretty spectacular. <laughs> you know, uh, no, but like, uh, we are the, the architects of, a, of the first uh, big mosque in, uh, in, in Copenhagen. And uh, the Nationalist uh, People's Party tried to, like one of their, like a 90-year-old um, candidate started uh, um, putting uh, my name and our client's name on his blog, uh, sort of uh, encouraging people to uh, kick our butts, basically. Um, but actually, the question was... It was it was wasn't about the, about the prince. <laughs> <laughs> was more about how do you see its fit between the, the two? The conflict between different well, architectural demands, really. I mean, of, of course, I can't say that uh, I could have persuaded the, the Prince of Wales uh, to do anything. But uh, I, I think sort of one of the main sort of ideas of our approach is a little bit this sort of sin idea that you make the strength of your enemy your own, rather than this sort of idea of always articulating and highlighting conflicts. This, the evolutionary rather than revolutionary approach is a question of where before you do anything, you try to sort of list all the concerns. And of course, when you're operating in a historical context, you really need to understand the context that you're operating in. I haven't seen Roger's scheme, but uh, we would definitely sort of try to make it very evident and very available uh, to the, the public and the, His Royal Highness how whatever we were proposing was actually interwoven into the urban fabric of the conditions, that it was actually, it might not look very well integrated or contextual, but it in fact would operate and be and behave in a very integrated way. It's essentially like the, the reason we, um, we did our book about our work, not as a sort of traditional presentation of beautiful images, but as a comic book, was this idea of going behind the scenes and actually explaining how and why our designs are shaped and formed uh, the way they are. So I think understanding in a very obvious and, and simple way uh, why we propose things like we do is a, is a key to, to having the decision makers buy into it. Um, come and collect a copy of his book. You get one, by the way, for asking questions. That was the, uh, I forgot to give you that incentive, by the way. It, it, it hasn't generated uh, many questions yet. But um, risk taking, do you think of yourselves as gamblers, as risk takers, as people who are, I mean, they say a, a, a successful business person is someone who's you know, more willing to fail than, than, than everybody else. I mean, do you think of yourselves as big risk takers? Are you? Absolutely. Without question. We're big risk. If, if you don't take the risk, you're not going to be able to achieve it, and especially in the book that I do. And but how, I suppose the question is, how do we, for most of us, taking those risks has a downside. I mean, obviously, it's paid off for you guys, right? I mean, but yes. for us, as we look at the sort of risks that confront us, taking them carries an obvious downside as well as upside. I wonder whether maybe you're just this self-selecting group of people who, for whom the risk paid off. Chemistry, um, I guess. Uh, you know, when I first started this business called Ultramune now, that, that trying to cure d diseases that need to be cured by a different way, I was funded by an agency called DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Association. They have a policy there that their grant the, the guys who were in charge of making the grants, if if they if they if after a period of four years that they work there, that uh, really only ten percent of the projects that they fund should succeed. So should I was into that kind of thing. Right. Should, should succeed. Should yeah. Succeed. If, if, if a higher <laughs> percentage than ten succeeded, they weren't being risky enough. They want them to succeed in a big way. They're like saying, 
we, we, there, there weren't things that there's a lot of risk, but the payoff is very high. And so, and the problem that, is, I felt the like problem the with way. that, Kerry, is, is that there's good failure, which is worth supporting, <laughs> and, there's bad and then there's bad failure, which is just mediocre and never should have been supported in the first place. Is how do you get a 90% good failure rate rather than a 90% dud and never should have been funded? Well, well, if you do, when you're doing scientific kind of stuff, you're learning something. Yeah. And if it fails to do what you think it did, you try to say, well, what the hell did it do? You know. I mean, what did that process actually accomplish? Not what I wanted, obviously. Then I learned something about the system, and I come back again with another idea. Because, I mean, my, I'm against those diseases. I mean, I think of them as my enemy. And so I, I, maybe I'm not going to learn, lose, I'm not going to win the first battle, but I learn a little more about how the system works. Okay. It turns out I, learned, I won the first battle. That brings us to a good last question as we have to wind up. Your mistakes. I want you each to think and look back and ask yourself, what were our big mistakes? What did, you, what did you do wrong? What do you regret in your life? Or have you got none? So I know you're thinking hard. Lalit, you must have made some mistakes. I'll make them again. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think they were mistakes. I think, um, yes, of course, I've made mistakes. And Go and share just one. There must be one that you can admit in public. Oh. There's so many, that's the problem. <laughs> Where am I going? Well, um, the last thing I did. <laughs> thank, you for, thank, thank you for bailing me out. <laughs> what about you, Kerry? You I, would, I think the mistake that I, would, that I made that I, I really regret of it is my, my personal relationships with the management of CETUS. I was a little too you know, open about my criticisms of them. So that ah, was the company the I worked for. This is, your, your, this is your strength, but it's also your... Uh, you know, I was willing to criticize a lot of people that I could have done it a little quieter, I guess. And, and I had ended up leaving that company right after I made them quite a bit of money. And so, therefore, I didn't, I didn't capitalize you on didn't PCR. Get the money. Yeah. Yeah. So they did well, but yeah. I didn't. Yeah. I just said, well, the hell with you guys. I'm going to San Diego. <laughs> PR, go on, give us a mistake. Yeah, I, mean, I was trying to see if there was anything I could confess, but I mean, I think actually... Uh, because uh, as an architect, you are so swamped in, in failure, and th there's, uh, <laughs> there are so many sort of exterior circumstances uh, that constantly sort of undermine your projects, that uh, I, th I think in order to survive that mentally, you uh, develop this ability to, uh, to sort of, uh, uh, what do you call it, sort of, sort of like self-suggest and sort of uh, turn any, any sort of failure into some kind of a, Positive, at, at least like an idea got developed that you could sort of carry on in another life. So I think, um, I think maybe that's like one of the successes, uh, like sort of secrets to, to actually uh, even desiring risk taking is the capacity to always see what, what, what you gain from it, even though that some yeah. ex exterior volcano eruptions or like yeah. uh, national yeah, yeah. bankruptcies uh, sort of sabotaged your scheme. It's, it's, it's asking yourself, isn't it? What what you could have done differently, as well as just blaming external circumstances. Well, we've had a fascinating session, and the, 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 two, the two things that come out of it for me are the approach to risk-taking and the kind of willingness to, to dare, the willingness to be different, and the, that word alchemy, which uh, you introduced, Biak, and which just sung out, really, of people who are just thinking outside their own narrow subject area. We have to work out how to give your books away, Biak. I'm afraid we've given one away. Think of a question, an architectural question, and the first five people that come up to you and answer it. <laughs> a quiz question. Oh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> let's think of one. Who? Yeah, so, so, like, um, so if Mies van der Rohe said yes is more, what did Philip Johnson say? Right. What did Philip Johnson say? Five people, first, the first four, actually, because we were allocated one. The first four to come up and give him an, the answer will get a copy of yes is more. What did Philip Johnson say? Good. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank our panel. Thank you very much. Three trailblazers.